and welcome to CB8 Speaks. I'm your host tonight, Monica McCain Sanchez. Tonight's guest is the Honorable Letitia James, who is New York City's public advocate since her election two years ago. And she has been a, a member of the New York City Council before that, which covered Central Brooklyn, uh, the 35th District. She was the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management, and she served on multiple committees such as Small Business, Parks and Recreation, Technology and Government, Veterans Affairs, City Contracts and Women's Issues. She helped introduce and pass the Safe Housing Act, which ensured tenants receive prompt and full repairs to their apartments. She's also served as a staff member of the State Attorney's Office, and during that time, she was appointed the first attorney general in charge of the Brooklyn Regional Office, where she covered many issues, including consumer complaints of predatory lending and unlawful business practices. She's also served as a public defender for the Legal Aid Society, where she represented low-income children and families in the court system. She's a lifelong New Yorker. She's a graduate of the New York City Public Schools, Lehman College. She has a law degree from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and she is pursuing a Master's of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Ms. James, welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, what I'd like to start off, maybe you can explain to the audience what is the mission of the public advocate? In New York City, we have three citywide elected officials. We have the mayor, of course, uh, we have a public advocate and then we have the controller. And the public advocate, um, I'm the fourth public advocate in the city of New York, uh, provides checks and balances on the mayor and on city agencies. It basically ensures that services are being provided to residents of the city of New York. Um, and oftentimes the Office of Public Advocate is an office where individuals um, who have a difficulty getting past the bureaucracy of government, uh, where they file their complaints. And so the Office of Public Advocate of the City of New York also appoints uh, a number of individuals to various uh, com com commissions and agencies. Uh, and the Office of Public Advocate serves on the NICERS board, the retirement board for the City of New York, where we invest in certain products, uh, trying to increase returns for retirees in the City of New York. What's the vision you have for your, your office? So when I ran for a uh, public advocate in the city of New York, I wanted to use my legal skills. I recognize that um, the law really can be a tool for good and for change. And so what I promised during the campaign and what we have actually done is hire some attorneys to focus on pattern and practice cases, uh, cases that can affect policy mm -hmm. changes in the city of New York and cases that focus on injustice in the city of New York, which affect a wide range of individuals, such as housing issues, discrimination issues in the city of New York, when services are not being provided to disabled children, uh, when services are not being provided to individuals who ride a Cessa ride, when services are not being provided to individuals as a result of a mandate. Those are the type of cases um, that we bring joining with pro bono law firms and other legal advocacy groups in the city of New York, including but not limited to my former employer, the Legal Aid Society, as well as legal services. We work very closely with these agencies in the city of New York to bring class actions and actions on behalf of individuals as a group. Hmm. In the next six to 12 months, what do you view as your top priorities? So since we've been in office in, in the last 17 months, uh, the number one issue, um, the number one issue um, as a result of all of the calls that we've received to our office has been related to housing. Mm -hmm. Individuals who uh, unfortunately are facing certain conditions uh, within their apartments and it's fallen on deaf ears by their landlords, uh, which is why our office was able to issue a report on the worst landlords in the city of New York. It's individuals who unfortunately cannot get redress, uh, cannot get the repairs, cannot get heat, cannot get hot water. That's the number one issue uh, and the number mm -hmm. one complaint that we receive in our office. As of today, our office has resolved over 11,000 complaints. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the vast majority of those complaints have been related uh, to landlord and tenant issues. What are the typical issues you've dealt with with the Upper East Side Roosevelt Island? I assume it's housing, or are there any others? So there's a wide range of issues uh, on the Upper East Side as well as Roosevelt Island. When I was a member of the city council, when I was chair of the sanitation committee, as well as the chair of contracts, uh, when I was chair of contracts, as you know, I worked with others to uncover the largest scandal in the city of New York known as City Time, mm. where we were able to recover $500 million as a result of outsourcing that had basically gone awry. When I was chair of sanitation, as you know, the city council, working with the mayor of the city of New York, put forth a swamp, which is the solid waste management plan. And it resulted in um, providing um, 
a, a transfer waste station on the Upper East Side, and a number of residents obviously were opposed. Um, most East Side residents were opposed to that. And what I wanted to do is bring some balance and some discussion to that. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, the plan went forward. We have heard from a number of residents for the Upper East Side, and I have joined forces with them basically to move a ramp, which runs down a major street where there's a number of schools. And so I've worked with um, individuals from Asphalt Green to make sure um, that we move the ramp and that we do it in a way which will not harm children, will not harm seniors. I've also uh, been working with the administration as we move forward to, bring, to build Technion on mm -hmm. Roosevelt Island, which is a wonderful university, um, Israel-based university, which is going to focus on technology, which is emerging industry, as we attempt to build back the middle class in the city of New York and teach individuals in the city about emerging technologies and emerging, and emerging skills in the absence of uh, manufacturing, leaving um, not only our city, our state, but our country. We've also been working uh, with a number of individuals on the upzoning of the Upper East Side, mm -hmm. working with Councilmember Gorodnik, who's, who did an excellent job on compromising a plan for the rezoning of the Upper East Side, and so I want to congratulate him on that. Um, as uh, someone who attended some of the meetings and who had some of the concerns, I believe that the ultimate uh, plan that that uh, ha that has gone forward uh, provides some benefits uh, uh, to the public at large. At the same time, provides for the needs of businesses as they attempt to grow and well as well as develop parts of the Upper East Side where there's been some underutilized space. So those are some of the issues that we've been working on, including, um, but also the biggest issue that we've been working on, obviously, are we've been receiving a lot of calls most recently from individuals who are just concerned about the expiration of rent regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and we've obviously, uh, there's, we believe that we have a plan as of today. We don't know all of the details, um, but one of the things that we want to do is prevent more um, rent regulated uh, units uh, from going into the private market. Um, uh, vacancy decontrol has resulted in a loss of rent regulated apartments in the city of New York uh, affecting not only the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island but throughout the city of New York but primarily in Manhattan as a whole. Um, we, we have heard from um, individuals on the Upper East Side who are living in um, apartments where landlords are, are basically uh, seeking to evict them mm -hmm. to take advantage of the market. We've heard from residents with regards to abuses related to Airbnb, where individuals are taking affordable units off the market and basically renting them out uh, to tourists, um, a top dollar, uh, basically depriving New Yorkers of an affordable unit in the city of New York. So those are just some of the issues that we've been dealing with. We well, actually brought up the issue of affordable housing and uh, what other um, efforts are underway to to increase the stock of it. Um, and I, you know, the, the land is so scarce in the Upper East Side, and it's getting scarcer and scarcer in Roosevelt Island, and it is a citywide issue. Can you give us any thoughts on sure. that? Sure. One of the things that we are working on with the administration is uh, to build on underutilized land and public housing. Mm -hmm. Underutilized, um, most public housing complexes in the city of New York have a lot of land, and what we really need to do is develop a plan where we can provide for the residents of public housing, um, as well as provide for a number of middle class individuals, including but not limited to artists, um, and, and a lot of young people who basically are seeking to remain in New York City, but unfortunately having a difficult time finding an affordable unit in the city of New York. But we want to do this um, respectfully. We want to do this, and we want to make sure that we include the voices of residents of public housing, as well as the larger community. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we build for children, and most importantly, we want to build for seniors who are living living in um, oversized departments, seniors who, chill, who, who are basically living, um, they are uh, empty nesters mm -hmm. and they're living in uh, apartments where they have two and three bedrooms and so what we want to allow them to do is downsize to a more modern apartment um, and at the same time uh, take that two and three bedroom apartment and provide it to uh, someone who desperately needs it, primarily someone with a growing family. Um, as you know, tonight, in New York City, there are going to be, there's 60,000 residents who are living in our homeless shelter, 25,000 uh, of those individuals are children. And so what we really need to do is rezone where appropriate, respecting the character of communities, but at the same time, look for underutilized land in the city of New York, including but not limited to on uh, NYCHA um, proper. What is the office's statutory role in providing direct support to tenants and other city groups affected by emerging large-scale problems. 
So the Office of the City uh, Public Advocate, one, can introduce legislation. As mm -hmm. most of you know, I preside over the City Council at their State of the Council meetings. I attend a number of hearings in the City Council. The Office of Public Advocate has the authority to introduce legislation, and we've done that. And in fact, we've um, been, we have, uh, have, were successful in getting laws enacted in the City of New York. So we have the ability to introduce legislation. We do not have a vote, but we do have the ability to introduce legislation to hold hearings in the City of New York. Not just in the city council but all over the city of New York we have the ability to issue reports mm -hmm. and do analysis and do investigations um, and we have the ability to join uh, with other uh, legal uh, advocacy groups to bring action um, which is which we would define as pattern and practice action or action which uh, really goes to uh, which can um, uh, affect policy in the city of New York mm -hmm. and basically trying to root out um, injustices and correct them uh, through either a legislative mean, uh, through a litigation mean, or ultimately um, through agitation by uh, bringing attention to an issue in the city of New York. In um, uh, CUNY Child Care, because you recently recommended tripling the funding, could you elaborate on the need and who the parents are who will benefit from the effort? Mm -hmm. When I was a member of the city council, I was very much involved in child care. And as a member of the city council representing Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, and parts of downtown Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, there were a number of daycare centers in the city of New York that were closing. Most of these were publicly funded daycare centers, uh, which primarily patronize, uh, provide child care to low, moderate, middle-income families in the city of New York. And so I worked with the then speaker, Speaker Quinn, as well as the city council as a whole. Uh, the chair at that time was council member Annabelle Palmer. And we were able to save a number of child care centers. And then uh, Mayor Bloomberg at the time implemented a program uh, in the city of New York which called Early Learn, which had an adverse impact hmm. on daycare centers in the city of New York, primarily giving contracts to larger agencies as opposed to community-based organizations, which basically knew the community and where most of the uh, employees came from the community. Uh, so that had an adverse impact on a number of small community-based organizations, which ultimately closed. Uh, so. Uh, working with this administration, Mayor de Blasio, he recognizes that problem, and we are working with this city council under the leadership of Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito to make sure uh, that we provide funding to uh, community-based daycare centers, child care centers, to provide uh, for uh, children in their respective communities. At the same time, we discovered that uh, students who were going to college um, who were trying to improve their circumstance a significant number of them had children and they needed child care and we thought it best that they have child care at their at their at their campus um, there are only uh, three um, community colleges that provide child care and what we wanted to do is expand the number of slots mm -hmm. at those three community college but even go further and expand it at other community college colleges as well as senior colleges in the city of New York and to increase the amount of resources that they are receiving um, in the budget in the city of New York. And that's why we had a press conference and we issued a report because this really goes to the heart of income inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, we, our office has really been focusing on the feminization of poverty mm -hmm. in the city of New York. And the best way to address uh, the feminization of poverty, the best way to remove, to get more women out of the pink collar industry, service collar industries, and more to white collar industries, which pay a higher a, a, um, a higher level of wages is to educate mothers mm -hmm. and to educate women. And so um, you can't educate women when they're focusing on uh, child care for their children. And so it's, 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 uh, it inures to the benefit of not only of the family, but it inures ultimately to the benefit of the city as well as taxpayers um, so that these women uh, can, can uh, be elevated from, um, from uh, from poverty into the middle class. Well, you just touched on education for women. Um, is your office able to utilize any of its efforts towards promoting that? So I have been promoting education all throughout mm -hmm. the five boroughs. I've been talking about the importance of education and then just using my personal story. Um, I do not come from wealth, I come from humble beginnings. I went on to go to college and ultimately to law school because I read a book called Simple Justice mm -hmm. and because my parents believed in the trans transformative power of education and they recognized that education can be used to overcome um, sexism and 
and all kind of ism, isms, racism, um, and that education is a way uh, to elevate individuals out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so just using my example, um, I basically uh, go and try to mentor mm -hmm. young women about the importance of education mm -hmm. and also about uh, making sure that, that we provide uh, that they place their child in quality uh, daycare centers in the city of New York and not place their child in harm's way, not place their child with an irresponsible individual who will, who will harm their child, child mm -hmm. and uh, individuals who unfortunately have no experience in, have no experience in raising children, uh, and that it's really critically important um, uh, that they get their education and that we provide them with the resources and the opportunity to do that. What I am seeing mm -hmm. all throughout the city of New York is um, individuals who, who do not lack the willpower or lack the effort. Uh, what I'm seeing in the city of New York is an opportunity gap mm -hmm. and an access gap, a gap to quality education, mm -hmm. a gap to affordable child care, uh, a gap to good quality schools and a gap to um, affordable housing, good quality affordable housing in the city of New York. And my and the role of the public advocate, along with the individuals who work in my office, we work very closely with this administration uh, to make sure um, that they address the needs of all of those constituents that I just mentioned, as well as at the same time making sure that we maintain and grow our middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear uh, countless stories of individuals who unfortunately cannot pay their taxes. Um, we hear from small businesses who unfortunately um, are being used as a cash cow. Uh, we have a difficult time, uh, we have a number of individuals who want to be entrepreneurs. They just need um, opportunities and the skill set to become entrepreneurs. And so we are, again, the Office of Public Advocate is identifying issues, bringing it to the attention of the administration, highlighting it, or in some cases creating legislation or um, pursuing litigation uh, to make it a reality in the city of New York at all five boroughs. Um, one of the, it, we were very critical of this administration as it relates to um, the individuals on uh, in the Rockaways who basically need a ferry service. Mm -hmm. um, and if we are, again, um, going to implement Vision Zero, one, we need to make sure that cars and pedestrians and bikes can live harmonious and that um, all of us respect the rules, rules of the road, but also that we implement a five borough ferry service, including but not limited to the Rockaways and mm -hmm. Staten Island. Yeah. When you're in the city council, you were an advocate for expanded physical exercise classes in the schools. Um, have you continued any of those efforts uh, with the, the power of the public advocate's office? Yes. So when I was a member of the city council, that was one of the issues, you know, as someone who used to run track, I haven't run it in a while, mm -hmm. but I used to run track. Um, I recognize that you sometimes you've got to capture um, the the passion of young people, um, and when you capture their passion, um, perhaps in physical education or in the arts mm -hmm. or in the humanities, um, then you can teach them um, and educate them further so that they can get their degree. And so working with the city council, I'm happy to say that under the leadership of Speaker Melissa Macvivarito, um, in this budget that they are about to um, pass, um, that there will be more physical education teachers in our public schools in the city of New York. Oh, that's um, great. Yes, one, because we've got an obesity problem in the city. Mm -hmm. And you have more individuals, particularly young people, who are engaged in sedentary lifestyles, sitting in front of a, some technology, some device, and that's all that they do. They're on Facebook constantly. And what we really need to do is teach individuals to get active. It's, it's consistent with what our first lady, has, late lady is doing, and that is getting people to move. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to do is get people to move, and we need young people to move in our schools. Uh, they need to, uh, we need more gymnasiums, after school programs. We need to get people to move but I don't want to just limit it to young people. We need to get seniors to move. Um, and so we need to teach seniors yoga. We need to teach, teach seniors uh, how to dance. Um, we need to teach them um, about creative um, activities to keep them mobile and um, to keep them mobile and to keep them active, which will also you know, activate some chemicals in their brain so it, could, it would ward off um, uh, any other diseases that, that might they might face, including but not limited uh, to Alzheimer's. Yes. Your office issues lots of reports, yes. and one that I noted uh, was that uh, they 
you had issued a report on nail salons, mm -hmm. um, which you recommend an incentive program, uh, cleaner air in salons, a safety study, employee protective gear, and other ideas. Uh, what are the issues you feel the public should be aware of that the report brought forth? Thank you for mentioning that. So um, we issued a report working with a number of advocacy groups because what we uncovered that in nail salons they were not being inspected. Um, what we uncovered is that nail salons are under the jurisdiction of the state, not the city, mm -hmm. and that they were really being inspected. And, and it's a billion dollar industry. And we've got several thousand nail salons in the city of New York, and there were no inspections. And what we uncovered is that there are a trio of toxins in these nail salons, which jeopardize the health, not only of the workers, uh, but the patrons who patronize nail salons. And so what we wanted to do was inform and educate workers as well as the general public. In addition, we uncovered that a lot of the workers in nail salons, unfortunately, were being victimized by wage theft. Hmm. And so what we wanted to do was bring them in and talk to them, but we really wanted them to work with advocacy groups. They feel more comfortable working with advocacy groups because the vast majority of the workers in nail salons are immigrants, hmm. and English is not their first language. So we work with a wide range of advocacy groups who have a level of trust with a number of these immigrant workers um, to inform them, one, about their basic rights, regardless of their, of their status as immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, two, we wanted to inform them about the issue of wage theft um, over time and also um, about ways that they can protect themselves against these trio of toxins that exist in nail salons, which affect their respiratory um, reproductive system as well as could possibly cause cancer. Mm. Um, what are some of the other reports that your office has brought out recently? So we've issued a report on nail salons, as you just mm -hmm. mentioned, on child care. Mm -hmm. uh, we've issued a report on mayoral control. Mm -hmm. um, we heard from, we had hearings in all five boroughs regarding mayoral control, and what we heard was that parents want a greater voice um, in the school system in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. What we heard is regarding um, s the need for more services for special needs children in the city of New York. Oh, yeah. What we heard about a smaller classroom size, the need for physical education, mm -hmm. or the need for um, health care. Yesterday I was proud to stand with the mayor of the city of New York. Um, a wonderful glass company is going to offer uh, free glasses to children, but we also need oh. to go further. Wow. Yes. Well, but we need to go further. Mm -hmm. Children need to hear, mm -hmm. right? And 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 children need uh, to have dental care. Uh, and so those are some of the issues that our office has been working on. The city of New York, last but not least, uh, we of course issue our worst landlords lists. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the most of the landlords on the list were in neighborhoods that are rapidly changing. Mm -hmm. And a number of the buildings um, in, on our worst landlord list. Uh, uh, landlords were basically taking advantage of um, immigrants um, and services were not being provided which is consistent with the law and so what we wanted to do is shame these landlords and in some cases take legal action mm -hmm. and all of our reports are online yes um, you have a very very good website um, thank you and um, uh, I wanted to find out how can people in New York get involved with your office you can Google our, law for our office and the hotline will come up. Okay. We have walk-in hours. We're located, located oh. at 1 Center Street mm -hmm. on the 15th floor. They can walk into our office and see a caseworker. If anyone who has a lot of, has free time, they can volunteer in our office. We certainly could use volunteers. Oh, that's in great fact, to know. Yeah. In yeah. fact, as I leave here, we're about to have a volunteer appreciation um, event this evening mm -hmm. where, where we will be presenting proclamations and just saying thanks to all of the individuals uh, who oftentimes are unsung heroes. Um, so we need caseworkers. Mm -hmm. We have we need caseworkers, social workers, lawyers, or just anyone with a helping heart and helping hand who basically wants to assist individuals. You don't need a fancy lawyer when you come to our office. You don't need a high-paid, high-priced advocate. Um, all you need is to have a cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we want to do is match New Yorkers who want to help with those New Yorkers or those individuals who need um, a helping hand. Mm -hmm. What experiences from the City Council have you been able to continue on in this office, or is everything continuing on? <laughs> so it's a continuum. It sounds like it is. It is yeah. a continuum. I've taken my experience as a public defender, um, as a litigator. I've taken my experience as a former Assistant Attorney General working on consumer complaints, 
working on police abuses. Mm -hmm. I've taken my experience as a city council member uh, working on outsourcing, uh, working on fraud and corruption. Um, I've taken my experiences um, as an advocate, as an organizer, all of that rolled up into one. Um, and that's the public advocate of the city of New York. You know, our office um, right now is, um, uh, we've filed uh, uh, an action in court. Mm -hmm. We're seeking uh, the release of the grand jury minutes related to Eric Garner. Again, that oh. really goes to my social justice yes. um, issue, uh, my social justice background, mm -hmm. as well as the general public trying to seek, get information with regards to what happened in the grand jury as it relates to Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all saw the video, yeah. all of us were horrified. Um, and the result of the grand jury not indicting the police officer really doesn't match up to what we saw. Mm -hmm. And we all know that all know that our eyes do not lie. And so the question is what happened behind mm -hmm. the closed doors and the closed closed doors. And we're attempting to use that experience as a way to reform the system um, because our grand jury system dates back to the 1800 and um, to Great Britain. And even Great Britain has abolished the system. And the question is, why do we continue to shroud the grand jury hmm. system in secrecy? Yes. And what we want to do, what we believe is that sunshine is the best disinfectant, and we believe that there should be more accountability and more transparency in the system. So that one individual, one individual known as the district attorney, doesn't have control over the charges, mm -hmm. over the testimony, over the explanation of law, and over uh, the interpretation of the law. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really, uh, we, should, we should reform that system and that's why we are seeking the release of the grand jury minutes mm -hmm. because at because we believe that there was injustice um, in that particular case and this is larger mm -hmm. than one particular case it's really larger than one borough mm -hmm. and larger than one individual mm -hmm. it's really about reform now is that going up to the state level now the grand jury system mm -hmm. lies with the state okay and we went to state court we lost in state court we just argued two weeks ago in the appellate division and we're hoping for a reversal. We all know that the governor of the state of New York would like reform in the grand jury system. Mm -hmm. The attorney general, Eric Snyderman, the chief judge would like reform in the criminal justice system and the grand jury system. And a number of advocates, um, a number of social justice um, agencies would seek, would like reform. But most importantly, um, I think uh, the Garner family would like to see some justice. Oh, absolutely, we think so. Um, do you think that's gonna be a very long battle? It was just announced by the mm -hmm. governor of the state of New York mm -hmm. that he signed an executive order mm -hmm. naming Attorney General Eric Snyderman as the prosecutor in any case uh, related to, uh, in any cases involving um, a death as a result of a police officer. That was as a result of the advocacy of our office. I am of the opinion that New York should not um, follow any other states. We should lead, particularly as it relates to progressive legislation in the city of New York. Well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate your coming, thank as you. does the rest of the community board. Thank you. And um, thank everyone tonight for joining us, and I'm Monica McCain-Sanchez. Good night. Good night.